Hello, everyone. Hi. <laughs> Well, uh, I, we are back for day two of the Microsoft AI chat app hack. Uh, we had a, a great time yesterday with two talks yesterday. And today we're going to be talking about customizing a RAG chat app. So uh, I'm going to start with speaking, but I'm also joined by a guest speaker today. Chris, you want to introduce yourself? Hi, my name is Chris Ayers. I'm on the Fast Track for Azure team. All right. So Chris is going to come in at the end and show us some cool things that he's done uh, to actually support customers that are are using this RAG demo. And for those of you who uh, haven't met me yet, I'm Pamela Fox. I'm on the Python Cloud Advocacy team. And also I'm one of the primary maintainers of this RAG chat solution. So I've worked with it quite a bit and I love it. Okay, so where are we at in the hackathon? Uh, yesterday we kicked off the hackathon and we actually had two talks. First was an overall, you know, overview of building a RAG chat app. And that talk was recorded. So if you missed it, you can totally go watch it. Uh, we also had a talk from uh, Cosmos DB PM about how you could use Cosmos DB as a vector database, as a different retrieval source, as opposed to Azure AI search, which is what we've been using by default here. So both of those talks are recorded and you can go back and watch them if you miss them. And now today we're gonna to talk about customizing the RAG chat app, the open source RAG chat app solution. And then we've got more talks coming up here. And sorry, my throat is still not in the best of shape so I will sometimes mute in order to take care of it. All right. Well, let's get started, Pamela. I'll let you dive into uh, your first part, and I'll join you in a little bit. All right. Thank you, Chris. Okay. So let's talk about how to customize the RAG chat app. Now, we're going to be building off this particular repo. This is what we gave an overview of yesterday, and this is our most popular RAG chat solution. And here's the repo here. So if you haven't checked it out yet, do check it out and uh, try to deploy it. Uh, you can watch yesterday's video to see my overview. I also recorded another video yesterday about how to deploy it for free and from a free account. Uh, so there's we've got special documentation and video now just about that. Uh, so do uh, check that out if you're trying to deploy from an Azure free account or an Azure student account. We don't want you to you know, have to break the bank while doing this hacking and prototyping. So we're trying to give you lots of options for how you can deploy this with low costs and from different account situations. So this video assumes that you have already deployed that, you know, deployed that repo, provisioned all the Azure resources, because you need to have it provisioned in order to start customizing it, uh, to start doing the local development. And now, if you haven't done that yet, totally cool. Uh, you know, you can do that later. Uh, and then, you know, you can still keep watching today because you're going to learn a lot about how you can customize that app for your particular use case, for your look and feel, everything you want to do with it. So we're going to be talking about all this stuff today. So let's start with local development. Now, for local development, we do need to first have it deployed. And the reason we need to first have it deployed is because we are reliant on a lot of Azure resources. We're using an Azure AI search for the searching. Uh, we're using either Azure OpenAI or OpenAI.com for the LLM. Uh, we're using Azure Blob Storage to store the documents. So we need to have all those Azure resources up and, up and running in order to be able to actually run the local server. So let's see how we actually run it. So I'm going to do this command here. So I'm going over to VS Code. And let me clear. OK. So imagine you're in the repo. Let's make this bigger. All right. The first thing you do is actually CD into the app folder. This is where you have both back end folder and front end folder. And from there, you can run start.sh. Or if you're on a Windows machine, it'd be start.ps1. Uh, but I am on a Mac, and actually I'm in a dev container, which is Linux, so I'm doing start.sh. So I run that, and what this does is you can see it says it's loading the AZD environment file. So when you use AZD, it actually stores lots of, uh, lots of configuration variables in a .env file, and it's actually underneath your .azure folder. So if you are curious, you can find uh, you can find that folder. So like this one 
has all these environment variables that were set from the AZD deployment. So we use the AZD to load that in so that we have that all, all of those in our environment and so that we're using the right search resource and open AI configuration and all that stuff. Uh, then we install all the packages that we need for the Python backend. So we're installing into this virtual environment here, this Python virtual environment. Uh, so that gets installed. Then it starts building the front end. So the front end are all these files in here. And this is a React front end. And it's got uh, it's written in TypeScript. So it's got to do TypeScript compilation. It's got to do React compilation. It's using uh, Byte to do that. So it's doing all this building. And once it's done building, it copies it into the static folder here. So you can see all those compiled files get copied there. And now finally it runs the backend server. And the backend server is a Python server. It's written in Quart. If you haven't heard of Quart, it is the asynchronous version of Flask, right? So Flask is you know, one of the most popular frameworks for Python web app development. And if you've done Python before, you very likely have encountered Flask if you've done Python web apps. Now Quart, is very much like Flask. It's actually built on Flask, and we're hoping that eventually it gets merged into Flask, but it supports asynchronous operations and asynchronous routes. And that is actually really important when we're doing a app for, uh, for uh, like an open AI chat app, because we really want that concurrency. Uh, I have a blog post about that here. Uh, and the reason we want concurrency is because these calls to openai.com can take a really long time because LLMs, they can take a long time to compute an answer. While we're waiting for those calls, we don't want to have to block our entire uh, our entire worker process on, the, on our web server. We would like to be able to handle additional requests from more users. So when we use an asynchronous framework, then it's able to handle concurrent requests. So while it's waiting, for an answer from azure.openai.com, it can then handle another user request uh, during that time and then send off another call. So we really recommend using some sort of asynchronous framework when you are developing apps that use LLMs. Uh, it could be Quart, it could be Fast API, it could be something else if you're coming from a different language uh, besides Python. But uh, for performance reasons and load reasons, we do recommend using asynchronous frameworks. Okay, so uh, that's why we're using Quart. So this runs the Quart application and just runs it in local mode. And I'll show you the actual command that it uses here. So this is start Dutra. So you can see it says Python M Quart. And here's the application object that it runs. Here's the port the host, and we've specified for it to be in reload mode. So that means it's going to pay attention to when Python files change. So if any Python files change, it will reload the server. Uh, so I can, you know, I can show that actually. So now let's make sure the server's running. So we go here and see that, okay, the server is running. And if I make a change to some, some Python here, it's hard to know what I should change here, but um, you know, if I just made this change here, I'll show what happens is that we're going to see in a few seconds, we'll see, there we go. It detected that the Python file changed and you'll see it basically restart the server. And it does, all this is like re-authenticating uh, with your Azure credentials locally. Okay, so that's how we can get the basic server running and have the reloading for the Python so that we can you know, make changes to, to all of that. Uh, but this does not give us reloading of the front end. So the first thing I wanna show is actually how to customize the front end. And that means you really want hot reloading for your front end, right? So this, is, this right now is giving us hot reloading for the back end, but not for the front end. So we need to actually start up a separate process that's going to, to have a server that can do hot reloading for the front end. So what we do is cd app slash front end and then npm run dev. And this is gonna run this byte server in reload mode and it's gonna run on another port. So now our front end is gonna be at port 5173 
And this front end is going to proxy all of the backend requests to this backend. So we currently have two servers running. So this one has the hot reloaded JavaScript file. So just fresh straight from the source. But then every time it gets a request to the backend, it's actually going to send it to five, you know, to this 50505. So we can, you know, actually test it here and see where it goes. And we can see that, um, where do we got to redirect? Uh, it's, it's basically, it should be redirecting. It, it must, it did redirect. Just doesn't show that in the headers, but it did uh, redirect to our backend here uh, in order to run this, you know, run this code. So now we've got a front end that can be hot reloaded. So I'll demonstrate uh, making a change to the front end. All right. So let's say I want to change this. You know, I'm going to do some rebranding here. Uh, so we're going to say, uh, so here's a tip. When you're trying to figure out how to change something and you see it in the UI, just search for that string locally, right? So I can see it's in a couple places. Uh, so I'm going to look at, you could also just specifically look in the TSX files. Those are the TypeScript files. And so then we can see chat with your data. Uh, so I'm going to say like, maybe it's going to be a chat about um, California plants. Okay. All right, and I save that, and you can see actually it says that it did a hot reload of chat.tsx. And when we go back here, I didn't actually reload; it it reloaded itself, right? So if I go add this, I go back, and there you go. I didn't have to press reload, no hands, and it reloaded itself. Uh, so that is you know how we could change a you know a little kind of look and feel of the front end. Um, in terms of what files you might want to change, the main ones are layout.tsx, which is doing the overall layout. So, you know, the navigation bar here. So when we like, you know, chat about native plants. So I could change that. And we see that instantly change, right? So we could change all of this stuff in the layout. And then if we're trying to modify something specific about the chat tab or the ask tab, then we can go into either chat.tsx or ask.tsx. Now, why do we have two different tabs? So chat is for having a multi-turn conversation. So in chat, you can, you've got a lot more features, a lot more functionality. So you can see here that we can decide to stream or not stream. So that's an option in chat. Uh, we can decide to suggest follow-up questions, right? So let's, you know, let's try that and see what happens in chat mode. So we get the answer. And then we get follow-up questions. So now we can click on these follow-up questions and then we can keep going. So this is a chat. It's a multi-turn conversation. We can ask any additional questions. We do send as much of the history as we can to the LLM in case we do, you know, um, you know, we want to reference something they just said, like, uh, what about three years? Okay. Right. So we can we can reference something that was in a previous answer and that ends up getting sent to the LLM as well. So it has context. So this <clears throat> chat tab is what a lot of people use. It's what people a lot of people come to expect because of GitHub Copilot and ChatGBT. Um, but we also do have a simpler tab, which is the ask tab. This is a single turn tab. And you can see for the settings, it does not support follow up questions because you're never going to follow up and it doesn't support streaming. Uh, so there might be situations where this is what you want, uh, where you, you know you don't want streaming, you don't want to chat, you just want simple Q&A and you're done. So let's check out the experience here. So we can see we get the answer, we get the citation, and then it's done, right? So it's a much simpler tab, but if it works for you, that's great because it's going to be simpler code to change and uh, not as much complexity as this chat tab. This chat tab has a ton of features, but that's also what makes it pretty cool. <laughs> uh, so yeah, so we have those two tabs and we, you know, name the files chat.tsx and ask.tsx. So, uh, you know, when you're trying to change something here, uh, you can go, you know, go into this code and and make the change and then see and see how it works. All right, so that is the front end. Uh, and here's some more tips about the front end components, what you might want to change, like we talked about there. Now let's talk about customizing the back end. So we're going to go back into that Python code. 
And these are the core files you should know about for the backend. There's actually quite a few files in the backend, but these are the core ones that you're going to be looking at a lot of the time. So we've got app.py, which is the entry point for the application, and that's defining all of the routes. So we've got the chat route, the ask route, and the content route, and a config route. Those are our, our main routes. Uh, then we've got the approaches. These are our RAG approaches, and we actually have four different approaches. So these first two correspond to the chat tab, and the second two correspond to the ask tab. And we kind of split them up because this first one is this, well, we'll say this one is like your standard chat. The second one is chat with vision. And when you start in involving vision, you have to use like a whole different SDK for embeddings and you have to make a different call to, to, chat, uh, to the GPT models. So it was different enough that we did put it in its own file, but it does share a lot of functionality with the main chat tab. Uh, we are going to have a talk on Thursday about using GPT-4 Vision for those of you who are looking into really image-heavy uh, domains, like ones that have lots of graphs and illustrations, that might be useful for you. But it is really experimental. We just added it about a month ago. So we have that in a, a, separate, a separate file from the main chat fl flow. <laughs> Uh, same thing with ask. We've got the you know the main approach for ask, and then if you do enable GPT-4 Vision to in order to search on image content, then it's going to use this path instead. So let's go ahead and look at what you might change in the back end. A really common thing to change in the back end would be the prompt, right? So if we go and we look at chat read retrieve read. <laughs> It's a long name. We can see that here is the system message. Okay. So the system message says lots of things. Uh, so we can say it, you know, it helps the company employees with their healthcare plan questions and questions about the employee handbook. So almost all of you are going to be modifying that, assuming that you're going to bring in your own data. So you're one, you know, going to say, like, all right, helps assistant uh, answers questions about plants and is super happy and uses lots of emojis. I don't know. We can, you know, this is where we get into prompt engineering <laughs> and we can see what happens when we change it to that. Uh, and then we've got here, which is the answer only with the facts listed. This you're going to want to keep. This is what keeps the conversation grounded where we, you know, it says like, okay, you're going to make sure you adhere to these sources. Uh, but then we have a lot of stuff about just like the syntax of how it should be responded, right? So this one has like, do not return markdown format. I actually have some branches where I do have it return markdown format, and then I render the markdown. So that's something you might want to end up changing. Uh, this one talks about whether you should answer in English or answer in the language using the question. That's something you might want to change if you're doing an, another language besides English. Uh, then you actually, if you're doing a language besides English and your primary audience is non English, you probably should write this whole prompt in that language just to like really skew it towards that language. Uh, that's what we've seen has worked well for people who are doing it for non, non English languages. So, definitely something to think about is what languages you're supporting and how you expect it to work. Because remember, these large language models they can speak more than just English. And then finally, we have the syntax of the citations. And this is really important because we, we do use a regular expression to parse out, uh, or even just a split, but you know we're using some code to actually parse out the citations from the answer. And so we do need them to match a particular format. And so this is what we went with these brackets. And hopefully that works for you. If it doesn't, do a little prompt engineering and you know change it. Okay, so here, uh, I I changed it system message now it's still gonna it's interesting let's try what see what happens you see it did it do an auto reload so I'm gonna see what happens if um, I ask out a product manager which is not a plant <laughs> as it turns out uh, I wonder if the new system message is gonna end up changing it at all let's see. Okay, so it didn't really, like, it didn't end up really changing it very much. I don't see any emojis there. Imagine if I just change it entirely and don't even tell it to um, use emojis. Answer with lots of emojis. <laughs> I just really wanted to use emojis. Uh, let's see. Okay, I'm going to reload that one just to clear. I could have just, I should just click clear chat. Okay. 
Uh, let's see. What does a product manager do? So let's see if we can get a little bit of a different response. Now we do actually, another thing you might change is the temperature. We actually default to a fairly high temperature. Temperature is a parameter. <laughs> well, I hope you're all seeing this. <clears throat> uh, so yeah, it used a lot of emojis. Well done. Well done, GPT. Uh, yeah, I, yeah, I, I feel like it's just made up its own language based off emojis here. Like, and I like how it just turned into all suitcases. <laughs> so if you are a PM, please confirm that this is this is correct in PM emoji speak to describe what you do. It's so great. Okay. <laughs> so as you can see, we did, you know, we changed the system prompt. We got a different response. Uh, so that that's probably one of the first things you'll be changing is that system prompt. I'll go ahead and revert it back. That was pretty great. Uh, so, you know, take a look at that. One of the first things you'll be changing, but you can also change other things as well. I was saying like the temperature. Uh, so right now we we do have a default temperature of 0 0.7, which means that ChatGPT models are actually fairly creative. If you wanted your answers to be more predictable, then you could lower that temperature and you can lower it all the way to zero. Uh, but then you, you know, you have less creativity in the answer. So this is just, it's just something to experiment with. And you could change that default here or as a parameter. Okay. So now what I do want to show is using the VS code debugger in order to step through the, this code, because I will admit this code is actually, it's pretty complicated, especially the chat read, retrieve, read. Uh, because we're trying to support lots of features, right? We're supporting follow-up questions. We're supporting streaming. You know, we're supporting vector search and message history. There are a lot of features there. And it can be pretty overwhelming to try and develop in this code. And uh, that's just the, you know, what happens with software and complexity as it grows. Um, so I do want to show how you could use the VS Code debugger to step through the code since stepping through the code is a nice way of understanding it. So what we can do is uh, I can, I'll, I'm going to stop the, the current servers. Okay. And then I go to the run and debug in VS Code. And you can see here, there's this Python court configuration. This all comes from launch.json. So if you need to modify it, oh, not that, launch.json. It is in here. So it tells the debugger how it's going to run and how it's going to be in debug mode. And then what I need to do is set a breakpoint somewhere. So I'm actually going to do the breakpoint. Okay, I've already got it in, in the ask route. So I'll, um, I'll put it there because that's a little simpler to walk through the first time than the chat route. So here I've got a breakpoint. Uh, we can go and put it, you know, like here. And now I'm going to press play or press run because it's the run button. So what it's going to do now, it's going to start up the debugger and attach it to the court server so that I can actually step through this code. All right. So we go ahead and go to the server and it loads fine because we haven't hit the breakpoint yet. So now what we're going to do, oh, we're going to go to the ask tab because that's where we set the breakpoint. And then I'm going to click on the, what does a product manager do? And there you see it actually switched back to my VS code. I didn't, I didn't even do that. It just did that for me. So it switched back to my VS code and it is on that breakpoint that we set. And now I can start stepping over the code. So the, if you haven't seen the debugger before, we've got uh, continue, which would just continue till the next breakpoint. Uh, step over, which is basically going to go line by line. Step into, if we want to step into a function call and then step out to step out of a function call. So we're going to step over this stuff. And this is just it figuring out which approach it's going to use. So it figures out the approach is going to be the retrieve then read approach. And it's got that configured. And now for the next call, I actually want to go into that run call. So I'm going to use step into. And now I'm in the retrieve then read file and I'm inside the run function. So I got in here by doing that step into. And now I can start stepping over again. And you can see that what we're doing here is it's just figuring out what parameters are being used for this approach based off of what was passed in, which is based off of 
uh, this developer settings here. So we go over it and we can see that it's saying, oh, it's going to use vector. It's going to use text. So it's going to do a hybrid search. Uh, we're going to, we're not going to use semantic captions. We are going to use semantic ranker. This is all how stuff about how we're going to do our Azure AI search. It's not going to stream because the ask tab doesn't stream. Uh, it's going to get top three results from the search. So now we we see all the parameters. And the first thing it's going to do is actually build an embedding for the user query. So this is the query. What does a product manager do? And it's going to compute an embedding for it using the ADA003 model. So it goes off, computes the embedding, and it thinks and thinks and thinks and thinks and thinks. It gets that. And we can actually look and see on the vectors list. Uh, we can see the first vector. So this is actually the embedding for, for that user query. So we've got the embedding now. And then now we can do the search. So this search function here. We could step into it if we want, but it's basically going to do a call to Azure AI search with the query text and the vectors and all the options that we specified. So it goes and does that search. So that's another network call. So it takes a little bit of time. And now that we've got back the results, we can prepare to send them to the LLM. So we're going to get the, the uh, system chat the system message and we default to this one up here, but it also can be overridden when people want to overwrite it. And then we do the message builder. And that is a, a just a function that builds up messages. It's the most useful when you've got the chat tab because you might need to cut off the history at a certain point because there's only so much messages that you can fit uh, into the messages list because these LLMs have limits, right? Uh, so that's what that message builder class does is figure out whether it needs to cut anything off. It, it shouldn't have to for ask, but we use it anyway. All right. So we go and build up the, the messages. And then we've got it. Uh, so then we finally do the call to the LLM. And we pass in the the messages. So I, let's take a look at what it is. Message builder dot messages. So in there we can see uh, we can see that it's got the system message. Oh, and then I forgot we use few shot prompting in our ask tab. Uh, so few shot prompting is a is a way of influencing LLM to give results how you want it by providing examples. So I forgot that we actually do that in this in this one. So this will be good. Uh, so here's our, we just do a single um, QA pair. So we give an example where we say a question and we show the sources and then here's the answer. So this is another thing you would wanna modify if you're gonna use this ask tab is you'd probably wanna give a different, um, a different few shot example based off of your domain knowledge. So it's just an additional way of telling an LLM, hey, here is how you should respond by showing it what we, you know, what we think it should have looked like in the past. So when we end up sending that question, uh, we we send those few shot examples as well. So we've got we actually end up sending the system prompt, the example question, the example answer, and then the user's new actual actual question with the sources. So that's here. So we send all of that off to the LLM to do a chat completion and we get back the response. And, and then all of this is basically just a bug information that we use in the UI. Or for, and I stopped doing the step through. So let me step through, step through. So you can see, you know, as it gets back the, the results, you could look at the chat completion itself and see what it looks like. You can also, you know, this is a debugger. So you could also add, use the watch tab. So you can say like, oh, chat completion. What does that look like? And uh, that should exist once I run the next line here. So here we can see the chat completion. So this is with the watch tab. So lots of cool stuff you can do with the debugger. I always like to show people how to use a debugger because it's a really powerful tool to be able to use to debug your code and also to understand how code is working. Uh, so I wanted to make sure to show that because this is actually fairly complex code. And it's not always straightforward how it's working. And it's always it's easy to forget, you know, different features of it, you know, like what I just saw with the few shot. 
All right, and then I can just play through to the end and I can go back to the tab and I can see the results. So that's using the debugger. Uh, I think it's a really powerful tool. I and I recommend it, and uh, you know, hopefully that can be helpful for you. Okay, so we've seen how we can change the UI. We've seen how we can change the back end, particularly like changing the prompt. Those are big things that you want to change to customize something for your domain. But the really big thing you want to change is the data, right? Because our sample data is a bunch of like made up company employee handbook, and you know, it's not that. It's not that exciting. <laughs> it's made up. So typically what you want to do is as your first step is you actually want to remove all that sample data, right? So once you've got everything deployed, it's all working and you've got new data you want to add, you do want to remove that data because right now it's in your index and you don't want to keep it in your search index, right? You want to have your search index be fresh and clean and only have the stuff specific for your domain. So the way we do that is we go into the prep docs dot sh or prep docs ps1 and it's got this call to prep docs .py at the bottom so what you do is you add this dash dash remove all and so that tells it it's going to remove everything from the index index so once i do that then i can go and say dot slash scripts prep docs dot sh and it's going to load in the environment and you know remove everything from the index. I don't think it removes it from the blob storage right now. I think it probably leaves it there because the really important thing is to remove it from the index so that we're not getting it in our search results when we're chatting with the data. So you can see everything it's removing here. Uh, da, da, da. So it goes through and decides what needs to be removed. It's just removing everything. Uh, there was even some stuff I added earlier. And it's, yeah, it's just removing everything from, oh, and it even removed the blobs. Okay, so there you go. It does remove the blobs and it removes it from the search index, which is the, the really crucial part. So we'll wait for that to remove all, remove all the sections. Okay, so everything is removed from blob and the index right now. And so now how do I upload new data? Well, I'm going to remove the remove all and then go into the data folder and I'm going to delete, I'll just delete everything here, right? Delete, 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 delete. Okay. Wait, that did, <laughs> I think that, did that delete the folder too? No, okay, there we go. <laughs> All right, so I deleted everything that was in there. And now what I'm gonna do is add, add some new files. So. Um, I've got a bunch of files about plants. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and see how many of these I can get up. So I'll go ahead and move these over to here. Okay, so we're adding a bunch of these uh, PDFs here. And here we go. All right, so we've got a bunch of PDFs in there. All right, so now what I'm going to do is just run prepdocs.sh again. And this time, remember, we don't have that remove all. So what it's going to do is it's going to look for everything in data because we see this data slash star. So that's what it looks for. It looks for all everything matching that expression there. So it's going to grab all those PDFs and then attempt to uh, attempt to ingest them. And so remember, ingesting means first extracting the data from the PDFs, then splitting that data into appropriately sized chunks, then uh, computing embeddings for those chunks, vector embeddings using the OpenAI model. And then finally storing both the chunk text and chunk embedding in the search index and also uploading that document to blob storage. So it's doing all of that stuff. And you can see, uh, you know, we can see some feedback as it goes along as to what it's doing here. Uh, so it's doing extracting using Azure Document Intelligence. You could also use the local PDF parser. Uh, if you're uh, trying to minimize costs there, that works pretty well as well. And so this is, all right, so this processing. So as it's processing, I can actually start, it's, I can start querying against this data. So I'm going to start this thing again, and I'll show you that this is actually updating in the, in the index here. 
Uh, so we'll find this index. So I need to look and first see what the name of the index is. So I'll look at that .emv and say, okay, this is the search service we're using. All right, let me find this search service. Here we go. Let me look at the indexes. Here we go. And what I'm gonna do is search star and see what we have in here. And you can see that we've already got some files, right? Whatever it's made progress on. So we've got Huckleberry and Prunella and Salvia. So this will just keep on building as it's processing in this window here. But that means that we can actually start making, uh, you know, asking questions about this data even as it's being ingested. So it's because it's, you know, it's updated in you know real time. Uh, so we can immediately ask questions once I restart the server. So let's see, starting the back end. How's it going over here? Still uploading over there. All right. So uh, I'm going to say, what plant would be good in the shade? Let's see. When I still have that old system message. No, no, I changed the system message. Okay. So let's see. Can we get, can we get a nice answer here? There we go. That's great. And these are actually, we saw these two in the index. Uh, so, oh, and look, it's using emojis. I did, I, we must have left that in the system message. Uh, so now we can look at the thought process and, and see what the thought process was. So it asked what plant would be good in the shade. And then actually in the chat tab, we do this initial, we, we actually do this step here where we turn the user query into a gener uh, a keyword search query for Azure AI search because it tends to make it a a little more successful in, in terms of getting good results. So this is the kind of an optimal step, but we do use it in the chat tab in order to get the optimal uh, search query to send to Azure AI search. So that got turned into shade tolerant plants for gardening. And then uh, we can see the search results. So these are basically what we saw over here, right? Remember what we saw in the index? That's what we got back here. Um, but for matching shade. So these are ones that presumably mention shade. Yeah, so it says part shade there. And this one probably also says part shade here. Yep. So we get back those search results. And then finally we send the system message and the user question and the search results to the GPT model in order to get a response. And so we get that nice response. And now we can also click on them and we can see the citations. Uh, this should show up from blob storage. Here we go. Let's try another one. That one working. Console 404. Let's see. Well, I have to see where those PDFs went to. Maybe it's, oh, I think it's coming in. I think it's just being a little slow. There we go. So there we can see the, the information there and we could try switching over to another one as well. So that is how quickly you can get started with ingesting your own data and starting to ask questions about it and you know messing with that system message and seeing what it can do. Now, I only showed how to add PDFs. Lots of you might be dealing with data that is not a PDF file. So what can you do if it's not a PDF? Because this repo is actually, this, this repo was originally set up only for PDFs. However, it is very possible to bring in data that isn't a PDF. Uh, there's various approaches. One approach is just to go ahead and convert data to PDFs because lots of things can be converted to PDFs. Uh, another approach is that Azure Document Intelligence is now capable of converting like PPTX and Excel and all this stuff. It just wasn't at the time we built this repo. So we just have to tell it. It's 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 a really small code change. Hopefully we make it today <laughs> because we just have to tell it like, hey, you know how to cover all these other things. So if you are using Azure Document Intelligence, you should actually be able to use that to parse, uh, you know, PowerPoints and Excels and even images and stuff like that. 
Another approach is to use integrated vectorization, uh, which is a cloud-based ingestion. I'll talk about that. And the final approach would be to write your own parser. And Chris is going to come in to show that. So first, let's talk about how, how can you convert something to PDF? So uh, I know some people have already asked about converting web pages to PDF. That's something I've already actually done in, uh, in one of my branches. And I use this Playlight, Playwright library in order to load in each of the HTML pages and save them as PDF. So if you are, if you do have web pages that you want to load in, one quick option, if you don't want to have to write any extra code, is to just save them as PDFs. Uh, so uh, that's one thing you can do. I used it in order to make some rag apps on documentation. So I basically loaded, you know, turned the entire documentation into PDFs, and then I just add those PDFs to the folder and load them in. Uh, you can also, if you do that, you also want to think about how you want the citation to work, right? Because right now a citation shows a PDF. So I ended up messing with the citation code and I, I show here what I did in order to actually load in the original web page. So that meant I did have, I needed a way to convert the PDF uh, path into the original uh, URL. So this is kind of a hacky way of doing it, but it does it does actually work. <laughs> so for those of you who, um, you know, this might work for, I did want to share this approach where if you have non-PDF data, but it's easy to convert to PDF, you might consider doing that. Next approach is writing a custom parser. So let's bring Chris in to talk about that. Hi again. <laughs> yeah. Um, I've got, uh, I've actually got a pull request out in the repo kind of redoing some of the parsing and so i can talk about that real quick in the use case i was using that might be relevant for some others if we want to share my screen real quick there we go so this pr is out there today um, we're probably going to merge it in soon and i'm just going to walk through it because what i wanted to do I'm, I'm a big devops developer person you know this is a sample repo and there's devops stories there, there's there's product stories here and I want to maybe be able to chat about them. And so what I did, and about, we've actually written a blog on it uh, where I wrote some scripts, I figured out how to extract all that data as JSON data, where maybe I want to be able to chat with it and ask some questions around feature requests and what are some of the themes that I'm seeing across my data. And so looking at my citations, um, I can see this is a JSON object. And so JSON is a little different than a PDF, than a Word document. And so, you know, coming in here, I went into prep docs. Prep docs is that, that script that Pamela was talking about. And this is part of prepdocs.py. So going into prepdocs.py, looking through it, I found that we do a couple of different things on strategy. And some of them are setting up a PDF parser or a form recognizer. And I made some code changes, and this is, like I said, is part of the PDF where maybe I want to associate PDFs with that PDF parser. But then I you know, had to rethink the idea of once we get the text out, how do we split it into chunks or pages? So for PDF documents and Word documents where there's a lot of structure and sentences, using a sentence structure might be the perfect ideal scenario. But for a JSON document, you know, you don't want to split on periods or commas or, or braces. Maybe you just want to split it based upon um, text length or chunk length. So, um, you know, I made an option here where you can add new file extensions pretty easily. And those get passed into, you know, our, um, our file parser. So these all get passed into, you know, the file strategy. And that's where these file processors go. And again, just kind of walking through some of the code. Um, and our file strategy does a couple things. It gets a big list of files. And in that list of files, we need to figure out how we want to process it. So today, if you look at the code, they have a PDF processor. And you see PDF processors everywhere. And it really goes beyond that, where we might want to be able to handle more code. So you know, we kind of made it more generic. We're going to go get pages from whatever the appropriate type of file processor it would be. And then we're going to potentially split code however we might need to. So all of this lives in the scripts prep docs area. Um, so you know we have this generic parser. And we have the original PDF parsers, so the one for PDF. 
a local PDF and the one for that document analysis. And I made a new one for JSON because I need uh, one JSON object or dictionary per file, or I have an array of JSON objects. Um, so the data I want to process either looks like this, or it's a single object in the file, or it looks like this, where it's an array of objects in a file. So these are the two scenarios I wanted to solve for myself. And so I wrote a JSON parser to do that. And again, I mentioned the text splitting. You know, we, we split out the pages and then we need to do something with chunking. So the sentence splitter, this, as you can see, we, we've got all sorts of syntax that it's trying to do logic on to extract out tables and text. And it does a reasonably good job of that. But for a really small JSON object, it, it would actually make a lot of pages and a lot of splits. And so I was just kind of iterating through it, giving me text splits. Um, but this is part of an ingestion engine. This is going to happen a lot. And so in order to make sure that I was writing reasonable code that worked well, I wrote some tests. And so all the tests live down in this test folder. And you can, you know, if you're using VS Code, you know, you can come in here and I can run my tests and I can validate that, you know, what I think is going to happen, you know, happens appropriately. And I get one, two or three pages. I can I can apply bookmarks uh, or breakpoints and I can debug my tests so that I can um, step into my tests and make sure that, you know, that logic I was working on trying to split up my pages does what I think it does. And so, you know, you can write tests against all of these things, against the, the text splitters to, you know, chunk things appropriately. And so that's where we are. I, all this code uh, is up there uh, in that pull request and you can go look at it. You know, we can see that in my storage accounts, it's uploaded the data when it processed. So these JSON files were all loaded through prep docs. Uh, and you can go look and see some of the changes I've done. I can share the links to this blog, but um, you know this is just part of some of the efforts that we were working on internally and sharing through like our AI in the Box project. So um, that's all I've got, um, Pamela. I can't hear you. <laughs> yeah. There we go. Thank you, Chris. So that's great because Chris's demo both shows specifically how you could do a JSON parser, but also in his branch, he's made it easier to just write any sort of parser. So you could copy, you know, and say like, okay, instead of a JSON parser, I'm going to have a CSV parser. I'm going to have an HTML parser. And there's actually like already, you know, people have written those classes out there, just not in our, in our repo. So, you know, if you are looking for, for a particular, you know, data type, uh, you know, we'll try and dig up, uh, you know, inspiration for you, pull requests. You may need to do some cobbling together. This is a hackathon. <laughs> so <laughs> you may need to do some cobbling together of, um, you know, of, of approaches. But uh, as Chris shows, it is definitely possible to write a, you know, a custom extraction for a particular data format and also a custom splitter. Now, you're not going to always need a custom splitter, splitter. JSON is kind of special. Uh, <laughs> but if you're doing like, you know, like kind of human written documents, you can probably use the sentence text splitter. Uh, but it makes you think like, well, if you're maybe in a, you know, if you're ingesting documents from a non-English language and the sentence text splitter isn't working well, well, then maybe you need to modify it to think about different sentence boundaries, right? Because uh, different languages might use different sentence boundaries, right? So there's lots of ways that you can customize the parsers and the splitters in order to work with whatever format you're trying to bring in. So yeah, we're hoping uh, that we can actually merge Chris's change into the main repo soon, maybe today, we'll see. Um, but you can always, anytime you see a PR that has something interesting, you know, you can copy that, copy that code or even check out that particular branch and then build build off that branch because there's lots of PRs that have interesting things that aren't yet merged into main, and you know you might need them for your particular hack. I do also want to mention integrated vectorization as another potential route to being able to ingest lots of different types of formats. So it can work with 
uh, many different data source accesses like blob storage, but also SQL databases. It can crack lots of files. So PDFs, office documents, JSON files, uh, and then it can do the chunking. It does a vectorization. So this is all in the cloud. So this is all being done in Azure. And this is a feature of Azure AI search. So uh, if you're interested in this, we also have a PR that's integrating this into our repo. And we're going to have a talk from the person making that PR tomorrow. Uh, so this is another approach because not everybody wants to have, you know, ingestion happening on their local machine and having to write all this code and deal with all this code. You see, it's a lot. So if you're happy to, you know, pass that job off to the Azure AI search team and, and trust them to, you know, do all this work for you, then you can you can set them up and, and use that. So we'll go into more detail on that tomorrow. But that is another option as well. And uh, yeah, so lots of different approaches and some of them are gonna involve some cobbling. So that brings it to the general question of how do you add new features, right? So we've seen that Chris, you know, in working with customers, you were able to add new features relatively easily. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm, I, I'm a, I've been out of the Python space for a while. I've gotten back into it more recently and yeah, so in the last couple of days, with your help, you know, we we did some refactoring and and, and some code. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that's you had to do refactoring because we wanted to make it pretty for everybody else to use. So there's a difference <laughs> between like being able to hack something for your own, you know, your own hack versus you know making something so it's in a state where we feel good merging into main because we're trying to both create a flexible repo like project, but also something that you know feels you know, usable, uh, cause it is fairly complex. So it's like trying to figure out how can we have it, have that complexity, but also have it still be something that you feel like you can use. And that's a really hard balance to strike in software. And, and you'll see that in the PR as we discussed, cause it was PDF parser, JSON parser, PDF this and JSON that. And it's like, wait, let's step back. Let's refactor. Let's think about this in a fully extensible way. Like how are we going to be able to make this, um, something usable to everybody? Um, where they can really customize th those data sources. Yep. Yep. So, uh, so related to that, if you're looking into features to add, I, I urge you to not reinvent the wheel yet because a lot of times people have done something similar. So my recommendations are check the pull requests, right? So you can go to the repo and you can look at the pull requests. You can see there's uh, like 30 pull requests on here. And so there's, there's pretty, there's some pretty cool ones. So there's like adding speech recognizer. If you want to text to speech, adding conversation history, uh, adding like an upload file mechanism. There's been two of those PRs, um, back off mechanism, the, uh, VNet support. Uh, so there's the integrated vectorizer that's going to be emerged and discussed tomorrow. So there's lots of potential, you know, ideas here for how you could, how you could accomplish something. And so even if we haven't merged into main yet, we leave these PRs open so that you can, you know, other people can take a look. And also maybe one day we will <laughs> merge into main once we can make sure they work really, really well for everyone. Uh, but to look at the pull requests, also look at other repos. You know, there's many, many chat apps out there. Uh, this is not the only one. Uh, let me see, is it on this list, right? There's other, you know, let's see, how does this sample compare to other chat with your data samples? This is an FAQ I have where I talk about other ones. Uh, actually, this one is the big one I talk about. And this is actually the code that powers that on the date on your data feature in the studio. And they have some features that we don't have. And we have some features they don't have. <laughs> uh, so you can see like, uh, if we look at their scripts, and then we look at, uh, let's see, is it data utils or data preparation? Uh, that's the search index. And then data, which one did I just look at? Okay. <laughs> All right, here we go. So we can see that they have a um, some other parsers in here, right? So they have some similar to us, uh, but then we have an HTML parser. So someone was just asking about this, right? So if you ask about this in the discussion forum, I'd be like, well, you know, probably what you could do is take this parser here and then take Chris's PR and then bring this in as the HTML parser, right? 
So that's what I'm saying is that, you know, the, a lot of times things have been implemented in PRs or in other repos uh, that can be hard to find. Fortunately, I have most of them in my head, if you could ask. No, I don't have all of them. <laughs> I, I know a fair few. Uh, so, you know, feel, please do ask in the discussion forum uh, if, you know, there's something that you're looking for so that we can point you to it. And maybe it hasn't been done yet. And if it hasn't, then, you know, then I'll say like, hey, I've never seen that before. Go for it. And if you do do something new, I would love for you to, you know, share a branch, share a PR so that other people can see it. Uh, you know, if you if you want to share that, because then we're you know building up the knowledge about how to accomplish certain features. So next steps are if you have not yet do register for the hackathon. I saw folks, a few folks say in the chat that they're not registered yet. So you can register uh, at the URL here. It has the link. Uh, you can introduce yourself in our discussion forum. So let's check out this discussion forum here. Uh, so this is discussion forum for the hack page. And so you can see there's an introductions. We also, we post the threads for each of the sessions. So we already have a thread for this one that we're in right now, which has the slides and the video. It's just a very live video. And so this is a great place to put follow up questions or you can put follow up questions as a new question, a new thread, whatever you wanna do. Uh, so that's the discussion forum. If you haven't yet deploy the repo using the sample data, uh, many of you probably want to follow this, um, let me fix that. Okay, follow this uh, this uh, readme here that shows how to get started with free deployment. And I actually did make a, make a live stream yesterday of me following that. So that is in the discussion forum as well, deploying from a free Azure account. There's the there's a video here. So that's that's the first thing to do is to make sure you can deploy it and ask any questions if you can't get that deployed. And then start customizing the project. So following everything we said here, the UI, the data, however you want to customize it, you know, start going. And of course, when you have questions on the way, post those in the forum or even in the repos issue tracker. I generally monitor everything and I'm trying to reply to as many things as possible. And then for tomorrow's session, we're going to have the Azure AI search engineer talking about Azure AI search best practices. So do join us for that as well. Uh, any questions that we can cover in the one minute? Okay, so I did see this question and I actually prepared for it. So how can we display the results in bullet points or in tables when the user requests it? So that's a really interesting question because we saw originally in our system prompt, it said, don't return Markdown because actually by default, uh, the GPT models really, really like to return Markdown. They're, they're big fans of Markdown. I think they must've been trained that way. Uh, so, um, so here, let's see, I was going to show, da, 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 right. So we could say like, um, make a list of, um, you know, or make a table of plants and their sun properties. <laughs> okay, so we tell it to make a table. And you also had a question about showing answers one at a line. So it is showing at, it is actually streaming the answers in because we are in streaming mode. So when you have this stream checked, it will stream them in and it'll also stream a token at a time, but we do some kind of massaging so that it's it works well. Uh, I have a blog post about streaming that talks about how we do the word by word effect and uh you know different things we we figured out while implementing that because uh, it was actually a little tricky to do it well but that's already implemented for you so you just need to have streaming turned on and it is by default and then it'll stream in now what you see here is that this is a markdown table and it's not being rendered as a table and um now the reason i got it to be a markdown table because i actually did change the prompt uh while <laughs> while i when i saw that question to say return markdown, markdown format if needed for lists and tables. So I got the markdown table, but now you see it's not being rendered as a table. That's because markdown 
is not natively understood by the browser, we have to turn Markdown into HTML. So if you do want to do that, I recommend checking out this PR, which uses a, a React package that knows how to turn Markdown into HTML. And it's actually a pretty short PR. Uh, I've actually used it in a branch. So if you are excited about showing tables and showing lists, I recommend you change the system message to, to make sure it, it does return markdown format. And then also bring in this PR here to bring in these changes to actually render it. Now, we haven't brought these changes in because it can be a little uh, jarring when we convert markdown to HTML uh, and stream at the same time uh, because it, it's kind of hard to interpret exactly what something's going to be. So sometimes what will happen is like a heading comes in and like, or it, it looks like it's heading at first. And so it gets rendered as like this big text. And then it turns out it's not a heading anymore. And apparently GitHub Copilot and ChatGPT also have this kind of jarring effect. Uh, so maybe it's not a big deal and we should just always have it. But that's that's been the hesitancy. So yeah, if you do want to have uh, you know, markdown support, especially if you're doing anything code related. So in my branch where I was doing something code related, I did bring in this change here. So that's a great example of making some small tweaks to the system message and then bringing in a PR to have some feature. All right, uh, are we able to integrate third party APIs with GPT Vision? Okay, so with GPT Vision, that approach uses uh, it uses a couple things. It uses, we have a special doc about it, uh, which talks about, you know, what it uses. So it's actually going to end up using the Azure Computer Vision SDK for, because it needs to do multimodal embeddings, because Ada can only embed text. Uh, but for vision, we obviously, we need to compute embeddings for image. So it brings in this uh, vision multimodal embeddings model. And then it also brings in GPT-4 Turbo with vision. So that's what it does from the get-go, if you wanted to integrate third-party APIs, I mean, this is all, you know, it's all code, it's all Python code. So yeah, you, you, can, like, you can always integrate more APIs. I've seen people who've integrated, you know, yeah, GitHub issues or whatever, right? So generally, since this, this code is all, you know, open and, and fairly low level, you can bring in uh, other APIs. Uh, we are gonna have a talk on Thursday specifically about vision though. So, uh, so maybe we can ask, go into more detail during that session. Uh, there's a question about sharing a link to my blog. It I, I can't post URLs in the chats, but I will just, oh, you know what I can do? I will do, um, you know, you can right click on things and say, create QR code for this page. And so if you're watching it, you can use your camera and, and read that QR code. I have a series of blog posts about, about OpenAI. So you might be interested in some of the other posts as well. All right, great. All right, so we are over now. Uh, so we can probably close it up now and then any additional questions, please do post them in the discussion forums so that we can figure out how to make you successful customizing your RAG chat app. Thank you for having me on, Pamela. And thank you, Chris. Thank you so much for joining and for your yeah. PR. I love PRs. I encourage everyone to submit PRs. They're great. So thank you and thank you everyone.